This is Professor Michael Chapman. I'm one of the most experienced IVF doctors in Australia. I believe that an important part that I can contribute is to educate patients in relation to fertility, infertility and all that that involves. These series of podcasts help to educate you. I hope they are helpful to you. If you wish to know more, however, I'm more than happy to have you contact me via email, which is profmchapman at gmail.com or make an appointment to see me on 91384222. During the week, we had the question about when do we use the genetic test? Well, first of all, what is genetic testing of embryos? What happens is that once we get a day five blastocyst, so that's the stage of embryo development just before it will attach to the uterus and begin the pregnancy. Once we get to that stage, the blastocyst has something in the order of two to 300 cells. So it's got lots and lots of cells. Uh, considering five days ago, it started as one cell uh, and divided, divided, divided over those five days, getting up to around the 300 mark. And what we do under the microscope at that stage is put a needle through the uh, outer coating, the, basically the eggshell that will open when the attachment to the uterus would occur. We put it through that uh, eggshell and suck out around about six to 10 cells of that outer coating of the embryo of the blastocyst. We then send those cells to a laboratory which um, can look at the DNA. They basically amplify the DNA, multiply it in a, in a uh, culture system, and then can count the number of chromosomes. And this has been a real advance in the last decade is the capacity to count those chromosomes. And what we've found is that the, uh, we can actually identify where there's an extra chromosome or there's a chromosome missing in that particular sample. So Down syndrome, for instance, is an extra chromosome 21. We can find that extra chromosome or detect that there is an extra chromosome. Um, there's something called Turner syndrome, where girls are born without um, the capacity to reproduce because their ovaries are deficient. That they are deficient in one of the X chromosomes, a female's XX, and she's an XO. There are multiple different aberrations of the genetic makeup that can occur, and by doing genetic testing, we can pick them up. Incidence of those genetic aberrations is totally associated with age. So, in a woman who is 30 years of age, in every 10 blastocysts that we test in a woman of that age, we would find that four out of the six were genetically abnormal. If we go to 35, the number of abnormal embryos has risen to 50 out of, uh, 50% or five out of those 10 embryos that we would test. By 40, it's gone up to seven or eight of the 10 embryos are genetically abnormal. And that's the main reason why older women don't conceive as quickly and have a higher miscarriage rate than younger women. Even more shocking is that once a woman gets to 45, when we test embryos of 45-year-old women, of which there are not many anyway, but when we do test them, 97%, 97, 98% of them will be genetically abnormal. So if nature's doing that, it's not surprising that, nat that natural pregnancy or IVF pregnancies are incredibly rare in women 45 years or above. They do happen, uh, just like miracles happen. And certainly I have a conversation at least once a week with uh, women in that later age group, women coming to me saying, I've now found Mr. Wright. I want to have a baby. I've seen that various film stars have babies at this age. It must be possible. But the media is misleading you because most of those, almost all of those, are because they're using eggs from women who are much, much younger. But that genetic abnormality rate um, is now able to be detected. So we use genetic testing, particularly in older women, to determine that we're not putting back an embryo that is already doomed. So if we do genetic testing, for instance, on women who are aged 42 or 43, when we know this, the, the, you know, we're heading up towards 90% of the embryos are being abnormal, if we've got two or three embryos, rather than have three embryo transfers that are never going to work, we can genetically test the embryos, potentially, hopefully find the one in 10 embryos that's normal and just put that back. And that embryo has got a high chance, like 45, 
to 60% chance of producing a pregnancy, even though she's that old, because we've excluded pregnancies where there is genetic abnormality. In younger women, we, we generally do not do genetic testing um, because the, the odds of them being abnormal are lower. Um, when we get frustrated and have had two or three embryo transfers without success when the embryos look great, we certainly do move on and do genetic testing at that point. In America, some clinics do it almost universally, but it hasn't, that hasn't happened in Australia. Only about 15% of cycles in Australia have genetic testing. The reason in America is a bit hard to put a finger on. Anything that happens in America, I, I, I do have question marks about whether it's been done for profit for the company uh, or the doctor. <laughs> um, there's a bit of that there. I think in Australia, we're very, very good in that regard, that we don't over service and given our pregnancy rates really aren't that different from the United States in if you look at particular age groups I'm not sure that testing every embryo uh, is valid because if you think about it getting finding the genetically normal embryo will give you a greater chance of pregnancy in that cycle we were never going to throw away that embryo it may be two or three cycles before we get to the one that's good, but it will get to it. So the ultimate pregnancy rate is really no difference whether you test or you're not. The other downside of genetic testing is that there is a small risk of losing an embryo. When we do the biopsy, obviously we're taking out cells and we can damage the embryo. We might damage you know, the only embryo that's genetically normal. Are we, if we're in most um, situations in Australia, we, we do the genetic testing after freezing the embryos, uh, sending them uh, the sample to the lab and, and then getting a result some 10 days later. So we then do a frozen transfer. In that freezing thawing process, again, there's a one or two percentage points of losing an embryo. So it's not without its risks. So people have various thresholds as to advising to have genetic testing. Some people say it's not worth the effort at all. Others will say we should do it on every embryo because we, we will get you pregnant quicker by making sure we're putting back a euploid embryo immediately. I suppose I'm halfway between those views. I think there should be an indication uh, to do the genetic testing, like one or two failed embryo transfers of beautiful embryos then the next time I probably would suggest doing genetic testing. But if I've only got one embryo, I would put it back rather than run any risk of potentially losing a good embryo. So I generally say we want three embryos before I re recommend doing genetic testing. In older women, particularly those that have had miscarriages, uh, perhaps it is worthwhile doing the single um, uh, embryo testing um, because they want to know they're not going to have another miscarriage, at least caused by that. Um, genetic abnormality. I mean, the data is very supportive of um, genetic testing in women who have recurrent miscarriages where there have been recurrent chromosome abnormalities as the cause. If you put back a genetically normal embryo uh, in a 40-year-old woman, instead of a miscarriage rate of about 20%, maybe even as high as 25%, the risk of a miscarriage with a euploid embryo is down around 2 or 3%. So there is an advantage there. I don't think it's for everybody. And when it first was being developed and seemed to work, people were talking about doing it in every cycle. But it's labour-intensive, it's cost-intensive, and there are some small risks with it. So I think there needs to be a good indication to think about doing the genetic testing. And don't forget that you can access all the previous episodes by going to our website, www.theivfjourney.com, and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu. 